Hello and welcome back to the Vacation Rental Blueprint, the show that helps short-term rental owners self-manage their property effectively and maximize their financial performance. In today's episode, we're going to be doing a quick dip into the waters of finance. And before you stop listening, uh, we are just doing a quick dip. We are not doing a deep dive into finance today because quite frankly, the subject we're talking about doesn't require one because we're talking about the foundationally important pro forma and how it can benefit your vacation rental. But before we dig in, as usual, my co-host, TC. TC, hello. How are you? I am doing great. And how are you today? Doing great. Excited for this episode. And I cannot believe that we have made a full season of a podcast 15 episodes in this is officially the kickoff of our of our second season just can't believe that we're already into a second season and and 16 episodes into this uh the sharing adventure yeah it's really been great i think uh you and i have both been incredibly encouraged and excited about the number of listeners we have and the interest that's out there. And it's that interest that really keeps us motivated to drive forward and keep bringing great new topics and great new guests to our listeners. So thank you to all of our listeners. We're, uh, we're excited that you listen and we're excited to be part of, of your community. Kicking off season two today, like I mentioned at the top, is the pro forma. And this, you know, we're, we're working on, you know, a couple different episode formats in this season. I, I think partner profiles have been very well received and we've had some amazing partners join us uh, for our episodes and, and share their insights and, and knowledge, knowledge that you and I don't possess. And, and as we've mentioned multiple times, uh, the real reason behind why you have to position yourself with great vendors and great partners because they fill in your gaps. But I, I think, the feedback we've gotten, and we've gotten a lot of great questions and feedback about these shows is, what models do you have? Can you share your rental agreement? Can you share the steps to establishing your LLC? What does your pro forma look like? And you know, we really started the second season with that in mind and, and wanted to kick it off in a little less broad importance of understanding the financials of your business and drill down into that foundational for many starting point for planning out their short-term rental, but also a tool that I found maybe not enough people are using to really model out their business. And I know you've had a lot of conversations with short-term rental owners as well, TC. And, and it seems like this is something that the ones that use it get great benefit and the ones that don't really should be. <laughs> Well, I think for, for many, the, the term alone is daunting. And the idea of developing a spreadsheet, a financial spreadsheet, sounds overwhelming. And I think what we're going to do today is demystify this for our listeners and not only make it a straightforward tool, but a tool that's really part of their you know, everyday investment life. Yeah, it's. I mean, you and I have been in the world of business for a couple of years now. I say that facetiously, of course, but you know, we've been doing this long enough and explaining P and Ls and budgets and pro formas uh, to just a wide range of leaders throughout multiple industries. That you know, it's we look at it as second nature. I mean, you look at you look at a budget. You look at a. I mean, <laughs> people think of uh, you know a K ten, and uh, they have no idea what it is. And I, I think we just. We have an understanding of all of these knowledgeable financial tools, but our job is and always has been to simplify it for our audiences, right? Like simpl simplicity on the other side of complexity is what we're trying to achieve with this show in general. And the pro forma is a great example of that. And, and I think that's where we have to start is just understanding the basics of what a pro forma is. Uh, and just kind of explain it to our listeners. And I think from there, we can start to talk about the fundamentals within that tool, but we really owe it to our listeners to just define what that is. Yeah, I think that's right. And before we get into the details, I, I think it's important to note to all of our listeners that you know the tool that we're going to talk about and, and share, it's not the only way to do a performer. This is a formatting that we like. It's one that 
we use and find great value in. But I know a lot of folks that have modified this Performa to make it slightly different for what they like to see. So again, this is not the gospel of Performas, but it's a great starting point and a, uh, a great model for someone to begin to look at the investment they have and what the returns are uh, on that investment. In its essence, that pro forma is just a projection, right? It's a financial projection and it's going to estimate your potential future performance. Um, and, and to do that, you're going to have to make some assumptions. You're going to have to put together some hypothetical scenarios. I think that the key on a pro forma is you're not necessarily trying to bat a thousand as a baseball term for, for accuracy. It's more of you have to generally directionally put together a model as you see your business performing. And in season one, we talked about cash on cash return and really setting up your objectives at the start. And I think that's that's still and, and always has been really that first kind of task and, and responsibility of, of you as a business owner is to figure out your objectives. Because if you have those in place, the pro forma really has a it has a direction to move in and the challenge for that performa is not to force it to move in that direction but be honest with the numbers and your projections to validate that your business actually can move in that direction yeah and it's a very dynamic tool i always look at my monthly performance and compare it to my performa and in some cases i have to adjust my performa because the numbers have changed and in some cases, it's just a good reminder to me that I need more discipline in some areas. And you know, if I'm running over on an expense or if I'm running short on revenue, it is that instant feedback that causes me and kind of enables me to make some adjustments. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged tool. It offers a lot of benefits. And I think the last thing we want as investors is to get to the end of the year or even the end of a quarter to be surprised where we are, to, to realize that there's a deficit in our bank account. A Performa helps you avoid that and helps you stay on track as to what you believe your investment should produce on a quarterly and annual level. Yeah, it's definitely not a set it and forget it, right? I mean, it, the, that's not what this document is about. I mean, it, it's really about allowing the short-term rental owner to effectively forecast their revenue, plan out their expenses, and model their cash flow so that they can make those informed decisions and, you know, assess their goals as realistic for their business. And, you know, with how the how the pro forma, how it's set up, I mean, it's at its most foundational, right? It is planning out your revenue, setting your expenses and, and putting your expenses in there, and then checking and reviewing your net operating income and how that all works together. And, you know, really it, it starts with setting that revenue just because that's the piece where, I mean, you have to understand the sales coming into your business to get a general sense of where you're starting. That's where, you know, the pro forma we use, and, and we're working on a model now to share with all of our listeners so that they can, they can see our model and then adapt it. You know, this is this is not going to be a model that we're we're going to share and say, hey, here you go. This is this is all you're ever going to need. Like TC said at the beginning, this is truly, you know, kind of this is a highly personalized uh, financial model for each business owner to make their own. But we can share a template to start that you can then, if you want to check, you review it with your CPA. If you want to model it and add or model it and take away, that's up to you. That'll be your uh, freedom. And we'll we'll share that with you, and there will be more coming out uh, via our our social media platforms and our website uh, to you know how to access these tools as we start putting them out. But TZ, really going back to it, it's about how do you go about, and how does your model go about forecasting revenue? Well, where, where I start, and again, this is going to be different based on the area that the owner has the short term rental. So in Florida. What I have found is there's three revenue seasons. There's the high season, which is your premium nightly rates. And that's going to be your holidays like Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, Easter. Then you've got your mid-seasons. In the Central Florida area, 
the midseason tends to be schools out. Kids are out of school. Summer's here. That's a nice midseason. September, October, when all of the parks transition to fall, that's a nice midseason. So it's those times of year when you can command not your premium rate, but something in excess of your low rate. And then you've got the low rate. And the low rate is that time of year when kids are in school and it's not quite as busy as other times. So again, in Central Florida, there's three seasons. There's low, mid, and high. What I do is a lot of research to determine what rate should I be charging for those three seasons. Now, if you're in a um, in an ocean community, I know several owners up in uh, the oceans of North Carolina, South Carolina, and those are really two seasons. You've got the season, the summer season, starts Memorial Day, ends Labor Day, and then you've got the, the off season. And how you manage those two are a little bit different than Central Florida. So it's really an I having a good sense as to how the tourist flows and then basing your revenue model off that flow. And again, for Central Florida, that's three seasons, low, mid, and high. And then you start doing your research on what the nightly rate is for each of those seasons. And I think that's, you know, when you, when we're thinking about the seasonality, you know, that kind of brings me to when we're when we're thinking about a percent split. You know, this is different than your occupancy rate, right? Your occupancy rate is just the general of 365 days in the year. You know, how many of those days uh, do you plan to have guests staying? How many of those nights do you have plan uh, plan to have guests sleeping at your property? This is kind of taking of those of that occupancy rate. Here's the seasonality split that I think is going to take that into account, right? So, you know, if you're thinking, you know, okay, well high season is, you know, in, let's say I'm in, in the Rocky mountains, you know, high season is going to be different depending on the ski season and depending on what those max rates are. Uh, whereas, you know, your, your mid rates may be more of a, you know, summer hiking, you know, kind of those peak season of, of, you know, the outdoor activities. And then your low season could be, you know, the, the spring where it's very rainy, uh, but you really just want to understand in your specific area where you plan that split out. Because from there, you're really going to start to understand how many stays do you need in each one of these periods in order to be successful. And that's where, you know, understanding, I think the next piece is where does setting your overall occupancy rate and then what that minimum night stay is going to be and how does that play into that next phase of revenue planning? I think that's right. I think once you've set your nightly rates for the various seasons in your area, the next is to really go through the detailed planning of what's your minimum night stay. You know, we use five nights and we always develop our performa very conservatively. So we calculate a 50% occupancy rate. Most listeners are, that are listening will probably say that's way too low. Well, for us, we take a conservative approach. And as the listener, as the owner, you get to determine what approach you want to take. But at a 50% occupancy rate, that means there's approximately 37 annual stays. In other words, 37 five-night stays. And then taking those 37 stays you've got to decide how many will be in the low season, how many will be in the mid season, how many will be in the high season. And once you make those determinations, you can now calculate your annual gross revenue. And that's a good starting point. And you'll come back and review this and probably make a few modifications along the way. But this is a very good starting point to begin the, the work on your performa. And the occupancy rate is really, I mean, just going back to that importance of the occupancy rate, I, I see a lot of times where, you know, if you get revenue wrong, and what I mean by wrong is if you're, you know, going in, in, you know, ultimate business optimist mode and saying, I love this property. I'm excited about this property. Um, maybe I paid a little more than I was, I was comfortable with, but 
you know, I love this property so much that I think we're going to hit a 90% occupancy rate. I think we're going to hit an 80% occupancy rate. By establishing the minimum night stay in your pro forma, I think that is a good defensive measure to make sure that you're not overestimating your occupancy rate. Because at the end of the day, you have 52 weeks in the year, right? You have 52 weekends. If you are you know, in the short-term rental industry, the weekend is your peak time during week, right? And, and this is when you're going to see the, the most people staying in your properties, not all, but the most of the people staying in your property. So if you have 52 weeks, and let's say you're a minimum of five nights stay, and you're Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, are you really thinking you're going to get a lot of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday stays? Are you really planning uh, you as the business owner? Are you planning effectively on what occupancy rate is realistic for your property? So TC and I are both very conservative on this front because we understand that top of your pro forma, you can really get misguided early if you're going into it thinking you know that that the best case scenario is what I'm going to model. You really want to be conservative and understand that if you're a 50% occupancy rate on a five minimum of a five night stay, how many weekends out of the year on average does that mean you're going to be occupied in order to hit your number and really work from there? You know, I, I always recommend starting, you know, when you're setting up your pro forma, just put 50% occupancy in there just to get the document started. Very rarely do you end up at 50, but it's something that says, okay, you know, half of the year I'm going to be occupied. Let's start there and just have that there to, to really start to make me help me understand what my gross revenue is going to look like in the year. Well, and we mentioned this on a previous podcast that on an annualized basis, we like our returns to be between 20 and 30%. Love to be more than 30%, but 20 to 30 is a good range for us. And by setting occupancy at 50% and then developing the rest of the pro forma, um, if I can hit my 20% at 50% occupancy, that gives me a really nice peace of mind that going into the year even very conservatively, I'm going to reach my annualized objectives on the low end. And now I can start tweaking on the top end to drive it closer to the 30%. But it's a really good starting point. It's a way to kind of benchmark your year. And then as you said, after you develop the expense side, we can always come back and revisit the revenue side to see if we want to make some adjustments or to see if we want to uh, push ourselves to be a little bit more aggressive on the reservation front. Yeah, so you you set up your seasonality plan. You set up your average nightly rate and how that's going to line up with seasonality. I see a lot of of tools being advertised online these days of, you know, using data analytics to provide a progressive or or adjustable nightly rate. We're going to do a whole different episode on software and technology out there for for STR. So, let's put a pin in that right now, but you know, I think for now directionally your low, mid, and high nightly rate forecasting and seasonality split, I think that's an effective way to get started combined with your minimum night stay that you want for your property and then your occupancy rate. And that'll get you your gross revenue. And that's your starting point to start to add your expenses into the business model. And the the expense we always dig into and we always add first. And I do this mentally because this is the area that I'm not going to, I hear it a lot, value engineer. You know, I'm not going to cheapen this piece of it. So I want it at the top of my pro forma, TC. And, and, and I think you and I are aligned here, but that cleaning fee that we are going to model out per day, we just want it to show up there at the top because that is, that is a form of income, right? On a, on a pro forma model, sorry. That's exactly right. So we have our gross annual revenue from reservations, and then we have a line item right below that. That's our cleaning fee. That's how much we're collecting per, uh, per reservation for cleaning fee. It's income now, and as we get into the expenses, you'll see how we account for that as an expense as well. But I think it's really important to separate this out on the top end of your performer. Yeah. So, and and people are going to say, well, why do why am I accounting for the cleaning fee as income if it's going to, you know, if I'm going to 
pay it out as an expense later. And, and the, and the reason is, is just that because the money is coming in, right? I mean, you are, you are charging a cleaning fee. You were passing that expense to the guest, but it, it is income coming in. And this is income that I see abused at, from time to time by vacation rental owners. You're charging a hundred and hundred and ten dollars a night and then your cleaning fee is $120 and you're, you know, that owner is maybe only paying $50 or $75 for the cleaning and they're looking at his revenue. Um, the, the key here is just accounting for the fact that what you might have come in for a cleaning fee might not be what you pay out as a cleaning fee. And, and it might, you know, it, it just gives you the flexibility to effectively track that money coming in. Well, that's right. And when you charge a cleaning fee, you have to also charge taxes on that. So again, it's another good way of keeping track of your revenue is typically a taxable item. So you're going to be paying taxes on that. And you'll see how we account for that as we get into the expense side of the performa. So revenue taken care of, we've got, we've got the, the, the revenue modeled out for our vacation rental on our pro forma. Now we dig into expenses. And just like I you know, said we keep the cleaning fee at the top, both for income and expenses. This is where, you know, I really map out what is that expense for cleaning per stay and then also for the annualized cleaning fee, right? And you're going to see this while, with all of our expenses on the pro forma when we share our tool is how much is it per and then how much is it annualized? And then what the annualized does is it gives you a sense for you know, how does this really play out in my revenue? Just putting, you know, I spend $100 per clean. Great, you've, you've tracked that expense, but you really need to add that per clean into how many guest stays you plan to have. Um, that, that's where the real annualized number is going to help put together a pro forma that flows correctly into net operating income and allows you to see true performance of your property. Yeah, when we build our performa, we like to categorize our expenses three ways. The first one is any expense that's directly associated with that reservation. So with each reservation, I've got a cleaning fee expense. I've got a cost for linens and towels because that's something we do off-site and it's an expense. Every time I put out shampoo and conditioners and lotions and soaps, that's an expense per stay. Taxes, both county and state. So we first categorize all of our expenses directly associated with the stay. And then the second category is monthly expenses, recurring monthly expenses like electric bills and water bills. And then the final one is annual expenses. And that's the, the, the cost of our annual license, um, the VRBO fee that we pay for pre premium placement. You know, we use PandaDoc to send out our rental agreements and there's an annual renewal for PandaDoc. So we also have the annual expenses. So Expenses associated with each reservation or each stay, monthly recurring, and then those annual expenses. By doing it that way, it really helps us think about where the expenses are coming from and how they're going to be flowing as cash out of our bank throughout the year. And then with the with the annual expenses, I mean, you you know, we're, we're not talking we're not necessarily talking variable and fixed because we, you know, I, I just want to, and, and you do as well. We want to keep it as simple as possible, but you know, those annual expenses, there's not a lot you can do to really affect those. Right. I mean, those are, those are pretty baked in expenses that a, you need to plan for and you need to plan because those expenses usually hit you once in the year. And they're sometimes larger expenses, you know, as you're looking through your expenses, and you're looking at well, where can where can I make an impact? Where could I cost save a little bit if I need to? You know that that annual expense is not where it's going to be at. Um, your recurring monthly expenses, not a lot. I mean, as we look at, and I think a lot of short-term vacation rentals run into this: of you can't really impact your profitability as much on the expense side as you think. A lot of these are the cost of doing business in short-term rental. And so I think that's that's eventually where owners at times think, well, I got to 
I got to find a cheaper cleaning solution, right? Because it, there's not a lot of other areas where they can impact their expenses. So instead of looking at revenue and how can I positively impact revenue, what steps can I do to increase bookings? They're looking at, well, maybe I need to find a cheaper cleaning solution. And that's where, you know, that actually has a negative impact on your revenue. Uh, you know, our, our friends and partners over at Cleaning b and talk a lot about this, where, uh, you know, are, is Cleaning b and the discount cleaning company for a short-term rental owner that's just looking for the cheapest solution? Absolutely not. They are a company built with uh, quality in mind and consistency in mind. And in order to do that, this is a people business and they invest in their cleaning companies and they invest in cleaning companies that invest in their people. And so another great shout out, season two, Cleaning B&B continuing on with us as a sponsor. And uh, you know, I, I think that's TC, when, when I talk to owners and they're looking at, okay, you know, I'm struggling right now in terms of cash flow. I think I need to find a, I think there's a cheaper cleaning solution out there for me. As we've said on multiple episodes, do not skimp on your cleaning company. Invest in a cleaning company because that's what's actually going to help you maintain your nightly rates that you've established in your pro forma. That's exactly right. And I think you you brought up a really good point that I want to reiterate. And that is the objective of documenting all of your expenses on your pro forma it's not meant to go back and say, how can I reduce my expense here? It's to make sure that you have exhibited and given the discipline required to capturing every expense that you have so that your performa is built accurately. The only time that I've really used the expense side as ways to minimize the expense is an, an example here recently. I noticed my electric bill was going up much more so than I had performed. And based mm -hmm. on trending, it had jumped up rather significantly. Well, having the discipline of building the performa and then tracking my monthly expenses allowed me to identify that I had two appliances in the house that were really starting to have a negative impact mm -hmm. on my electric bill. So that's what I use it for. But you said it and it's spot on. There's not many places you can reduce your expenses. It's more about capturing them. So now we can go back to our revenue side and see if we want to make any adjustments there that will have a positive impact on our operating income. I've talked to so many owners who, you know, right now they're struggling with with bookings a little bit. I mean, just in, in our area, this is sort of the calm before the storm, uh, you know, as, as schools are wrapping up this time of year and they're just looking at it and they're, you know, they're covering their mortgage on their vacation rental out of pocket, not out of business, but they don't know their cash out. They don't have a clear understanding of their cash out, not so that they can cut it, but just so they can understand like, hey, if I'm planning, if I know that low season TC like we identified is, uh, you know, is this period and this period in a calendar year, I know that these uh, recurring monthly expenses are still going to hit me. I And I know where any of these annualized expenses may be hitting me during a slower time of year so I can plan accordingly to that versus, well, you know, it's a busy season and it is the busy season. And I know right now that I've got rental revenue coming in that covers my expenses. Great. You've won, you, you've won a single month out of a calendar year. Your goal needs to be right now, well, not only do I need to be able to cover this month's expense during the peak season, but this month also needs to cover, you know, month X, Y, and Z. So I, because I know these, these monthly uh, recurring expenses are still going to hit me during a slow period. And I need to account for if that's $3,000 of monthly recurring expense on top of, you know, mortgage payments and, and those pieces, uh, you've got to be able to be aware of that. And the ones that I talk to, the individuals I talk to that are struggling right now are the ones that just don't have a firm grasp on their expenses, let alone as we kind of go into the next section of this, let alone setting aside cash reserves uh, for 
the those unforeseen or planned larger projects that need to go into your property. That's right. And we'll get into this in a later episode. But after you build the Performa, it's also a very good practice to now build month by month what you expect to happen throughout the year. And, and we do that. And we know that May is a very low season. We know that there are some Mays where we actually lose a little money, but it's expected and it's built into the annual uh, approach. So by going month to month, we see that December generates a ton of cash. First part of February, uh, January generates a ton of cash and you get to monitor it month by month. And it's another good discipline that we'll get into down the road because that prevents the panic of, oh my goodness, I didn't have any revenue in May, but I still had expenses. Well, if you expect it because you built your model that way, it creates less of a panic and less of a, of a knee-jerk reaction. But then your other point is spot on. The last category of this Performa is building in cash reserves. Now we show it on the Performa as an expense but it's not a cash expense. It's a reserve. It's setting money aside for those repairs, for those appliance replacements that you're going to have. And it's just keeping that bank of money, that pool of money set aside that you're expecting to spend. And if you don't, good on you. It's more profit to you, but setting up that reserve creates that cash bank so that you can continue to invest in those repairs, the maintenance and the upgrades. And I would challenge all of our listeners that, you know, if you don't think that you need to spend your reserves, like TC said, congratulations, good on you. But I would really challenge you to assess your property. I mean, these are these are lived in spaces that you are you are in the business of operating. And when people live in spaces, wear and tear happens. Uh, you may be putting those cash reserves aside for an unforeseen repair and you've had great tenants and there's been no damages and you're sitting on this and maybe there's a project that you uh, you do want to add to your property. Maybe it is just a simple, uh, I want to repaint our high touch corners or I want to add a ceiling fan to a patio or I want to add any number of things to your property. Uh, that's where that reserve can come from. The challenge is, that reserve should not be model, modeled out necessarily as cover, covering revenue losses uh, in, in a single month. It's it's a reserve. I mean, you were planning, so if you want it to, it's, it's fine because like TC said, it's not necessarily an expense, it's a reserve. The challenge is how do you keep the integrity of your business operating at a high level through leveraging those cash reserves strategically in order to... Uh, maintain or improve your space over the long term. Yeah. And in one of our properties, we decided here recently uh, to use some of our cash reserve. You know, when we're recording this here in May, we're getting ready to go into the hurricane season. So we decided to use some of our cash reserve in one of the properties and install whole home surge protection because this is the time of year or we're going into the time of year when not only hurricanes, but thunder, lightning. Um, it can be a daily occurrence. So the whole home surge protection, it's an investment. We're taking money out of our cash reserve, but it's designed to prevent long-term expenses of if lightning does hit, you know, taking out all of your appliances or taking out all of your televisions. So it's one of those investments that we decided to use our reserve for. There's many things like that that we think about and consider. And I think that's just a healthy way of thinking about that, uh, that reserve you've set up. And the, the question I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with, cause I hear, you know, some, some individuals thinking it to themselves right now is where do I put that money? Like what, what does that money just sit in my, my business bank account? Do I put that somewhere else? Do I, you know, take that money? It, and really that falls to you and your business. Uh, the, the key is just understanding, you know, when you're running a business effectively, you can't just jump into your check account, uh, checking account and measure the health of your business. Uh, that's not how, uh, you know, income and expenses ebb and flow out of most businesses, right? Like you're, you are looking at it and saying, okay, well, you know, if annualized, I have a, a you know 
let's say five thousand dollars in reserves and you know this is a slow month but i've had three really good months so when i log into my checking account and i see three thousand two hundred and eighty dollars for most people there's no way you can check and and check that and say i'm i'm doing good i'm on target or oh man i'm I'm a little behind right now. You really need to have this model built out so that you understand how much the money uh, of the money that's flowing in is flowing out on any any particular month and then that will give you a better sense. You know, if you're getting into December and you haven't spent any of your reserves and you knew you plan to have $5,000 in reserves for the calendar year, but you're, you know, you've got $1,000 at the beginning of of month 12, that may tell you a story that causes you to just jump into your pro forma and say, okay, I really got to look at this. I got really got to look at my revenue and how is it performing versus my model? Because I had planned and without spending any of the reserves, I, I had planned to have $5,000 because I wanted to knock out this big project in January. Uh, you know, but but it's not there. I'm not negative. I'm not bouncing a checking account. So for some people, they may look at it and say, that, that's a win. I did it. Uh, but, you know, in, in reality, having this model really gives you a truer sense to your performance at any given point and where you should be. That's right. And then the, the last piece. So, you know, we've calculated our revenue from reservations. We've added the revenue from the cleaning fee. We've then deducted our expenses associated with each reservation, and then our monthly recurring expenses, and then our annual expenses and reserve. And now we're able to calculate our net operating income. And on the model, I think you're going to be sharing with our listeners, you'll see that we came up with a 17.77% return. Well, yep. that's lower then we want our lowest of the threshold is 20%. So now we're going to go back and take a hard look at our revenue to see what can we do a bit differently? What behaviors can we change to take that 50% occupancy to maybe 55 or 60? So we're not going to go from 50 to 90. That's unrealistic. But how can we bump it up? How can we tweak it a bit and then how can we change our behaviors and our strategy and tactics to you know, realize more of a 60% occupancy rate and get closer to that low end 20% return uh, versus the 17.77. So it's a nice cyclical model of revenue, expenses, bottom line. Take a look at your bottom line compared to what you expect to return and then go back to the top and work on your revenue again. Yep. And, and <laughs> it's not lost on us that we are kicking off season two on a finance pro forma. You know, a, a lot of people will listen to this and maybe glaze over it a little bit and say, oh my God, these guys are talking numbers. This is, uh, you know, but, but it, this really is the foundation of uh, effective long-term planning and short-term adjusting to match long-term plans. I mean, w when we think about best practices for effectively managing your business, it is jumping into your pro forma. TC, I don't know about you, but I'm lo I'm looking at it monthly. At the end of the month, I'm looking at it, going, okay, where where can we improve? How are we on on path for the year? Uh, is there are there any updates that need to be hap uh, happening in within the document? And most times, the answer is no. But that doesn't mean you don't look at it. And then the other challenge is when things aren't going well, which this is a cyclical industry. I mean, there's ups and there's downs. When things aren't going well, don't be scared to jump into your numbers because th there is that inherent fear that I've seen for many first-time short-term rental owners of they just know that they're having to carry their mortgage for their short-term rental out of their personal income or their their personal uh, checking account or whatever account, worried to jump in there. They, there's a fear to jump in and say, well... I modeled 60% occupancy, I modeled all of these average nightly rates, and that's not working, or that's not modeling out as I planned. The last thing you want to do is be fearful of, some, of something as simple as a spreadsheet to, to track your performance. So regularly review this, regularly update it. Market conditions are changing all the time based on actual performance, jump in to your tool and update it. And 
And this isn't a complicated tool. When, when I share this, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll, we'll communicate out when, when this document is ready to share. It is a simple spreadsheet. We don't have anything in here that is overly complicated. This is a simple spreadsheet that is a bunch of inputs and then minuses and, and you know, basic Excel or Google spreadsheet functioning. It allows you to dig deeper. If, if you are an Excel pro, if you are just, you know, you'll, you'll look at our, our spreadsheet and go, this is simple. Uh, yeah, it is simple. But the beauty of these spreadsheets is if you know the platform, you can automate and make these things as complicated and connecting macros and and get, getting real-time insights. You can make this as compl uh, complex as you want, or you can keep it as simple as what we're presenting. Um, it's really up to you, and that's the beauty of a pro forma, is it is designed to just be cut and dry, basic, here's your income, here's your expenses, here's where you're shaking out. If we are modeling something at 17.77 uh, for a net operating income, year one, we modeled out 15%. But year two, we modeled out 20 and we're not quite hitting 20. Okay, we got to dig into it. We got to figure out, we have to troubleshoot a little bit on where where are some positive areas we can impact. It's not going to be cleaning. Do, do not highly, highly recommend to you that you do not consider discount shopping your cleaning because long term, man, that's going to just tear apart your ability to make revenue at high and medium rates. Um, and, and that's that's just my reminder and recommendation for everyone listening is, you know, I, I can't stress enough, focus less on your expenses and managing down your expenses. Be accurate with your expenses and make sure what you're spending money on matches your goals for your property and then figure out what you can do to drive revenue within your business for maximum efficacy and maximum uh, net operating income. Well, and I think our listeners will get a lot of value out of the model that you're going to share with them. Doesn't mean everyone's going to use it, but it's a great starting point. It's a it's a pretty straightforward model, but let's recap. I'm the master of the recap. So let's recap. You know, if you're an owner of an investment property, it is just that. It is an investment, and you want that investment to deliver operating income to you, the investor. So where do we start? We start by breaking our year down into seasons that make sense for your area. In Central Florida, we break it down into three seasons, your low, your mid, your high. We then set nightly rates for each of those seasons. And then we determine the occupancy rate as a starting point for our performa along with average nightly stay. So average nightly stay for us, five nights, and the occupancy rate we start with is 50%. We then have four categories of expenses. You've got your expenses associated with each reservation. You've got your monthly recurring. You've got your annual recurring, and then you've got your reserve. It's set up as an expense, even though it's actually not cash out of your bank yet, and then you get to your bottom line and you determine, is your bottom line delivering what you want your investment to deliver? And if not, don't go start cutting expenses because it's very unlikely you'll be able to do so. Go to your top, push yourself, force yourself to think creatively about how you can drive more revenue to that investment. And then later episode, Let's break this down to monthly so that you're not panicking when you have a down month or you know, high-fiving the world when you have an up month. Um, it's not meant to be that. It's meant to be uh, uh, very cyclical to the course of the year. So that's my summary, and I think the model will make a ton of sense when you send it out to our listeners. Yep. As always, TC, I love your, uh, I love your summaries. They bring everything back home uh, to kind of the core core of what we talked about today. And and again, thanks thanks for being an awesome co-host. Here we are in season two. Can't believe we're here already. It feels like we just started recording uh, yesterday. And uh, you know, I think for our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. Thank you for subscribing, listening. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe if you haven't. Leave us a review. 
reach out to us, and most, most importantly, share this with others that you know that are interested in exciting uh, in the exciting real estate endeavor of short-term rentals. Uh, finally, we, uh, we have a little website landing page to best navigate to your listening uh, platform of choice. It is strconsultants.co. That's strconsultants.co. Connect with us there across all our different platforms and even reach out to us with ideas or anything you want us to talk about because we love the feedback and we love hearing for, uh, from you. So uh, as a reminder, thanks again. The key to financial success in your short-term rental business starts with an accurate performance analysis. Thanks all, and we'll see you in the next episode.